Good morning. My name is Banny Prunty and I'm a research associate with the Public Policy Institute of California. Thank you for tuning into our program today, featuring the findings of a new PPIC report, setting the stage for universal preschool, is transitional kindergarten serving students equitably. I'd like to thank the Sobrato Family Foundation for the support of this report and today's event. Today's program will feature a presentation of key findings from the report, followed by an expert panel discussion moderated by my colleague and co-author, Laura Hill. The report, policy brief, technical appendices, as well as the slides from today's presentation are available on our website at ppic.org. A few final housekeeping items before we start today's program. As a reminder, PPIC is a public charity and does not take or support positions on any ballot measure or legislation, nor does it support, endorse, or oppose any political parties or candidates for public office. And at the end of today's program, we have set aside some time to answer audience Q&A. If you have a question for our panelists, please send an email to the address on the screen, ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. We would appreciate you including your name and organization along with your question. And with that, I'll begin the presentation. So what is transitional kindergarten or TK? California started TK in 2012-2013 for children who turned five in the fall, specifically children with birth dates from September to November. And without TK, uh, these students would have to wait up the following year to enroll into kindergarten. So with TK, TK acts as an extra year of kindergarten. And for TK programs, there are at least three hours a day. Uh, so there's part day or full day. And sometimes TK students are held in the same classrooms as other kindergarten students. Unlike other preschool programs, teachers must have uh, bachelor's degrees and early childhood education units. And every school district serving kindergartners must offer TK, although it may not be true for every school. Okay, so why does TK matter now? Well, for one, eligibility will expand to all four-year-olds by 2025-26. So all four-year-olds, regardless of their birth dates, will be eligible for TK. Currently, about a quarter of four-year-olds are eligible. And TK is also important because children arrive in kindergarten with a wide range of readiness. An extra year can help students who are not at their grade level. And specifically for California, California has lower rates of preschool attendance relative to other states. So for comparison, Vermont, Wisconsin, and Florida um, all have about 70% of the preschool students uh, in some type of preschool program, where California has about 37% of all four-year-olds in a preschool program. And then TK is also important for working families because childcare and preschool are helpful for them when they're at work, um, especially for those who are not able to work from home. So with this graph, I'm showing you TK enrollment over time. Um, and in 2014, that was the last year that eligibility was expanded. So it was expanded um, from September to November birth dates to September to December birth dates. And we can see since 2014, enrollment has increased uh, over time and then peaked in 2018-19 at about 90,000 students. So what are our research questions on the eve of expansion? So first, what are the characteristics of students enrolled in TK? And again, we're looking at this from an equity perspective. So we'll be using different demographic characteristics such as dual language learner status, uh, race and ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. We'll be using these uh, characteristics for our next questions as well. So what are the characteristics of districts and schools offering TK? What are the characteristics of families that appear likely to participate? And one of the most important questions is which equity gaps need to be addressed during TK expansion, because we are under the impression that expanding eligibility does not automatically address equity gaps that are present now. So how do we gauge participation? So first, we take the notion that about a quarter of all kindergartners are eligible for TK. So with that in mind, we take the enrollment numbers for TK and then divide that by the uh, current kindergarten class, the current kindergarten enrollment, and say that this ratio should equal about 20, or 0.25 or 25% since 25% of the entire kindergarten class is eligible for TK. So this is why in this graph, I'm showing you the 
quote unquote take up rate or the participation rate on the vertical axis. And we see that full take up, which is the uh, blue dotted line is at that 25%. Because again, 25% of the kindergarten class is eligible for TK. So that will be the optimal participation rate. So we see that with this bluish purple line, uh, dual language learners in 2019 had the highest take up rate out of these three categories, followed by all students. And then right next to it is students eligible for free and reduced price meals. And although dual language learners overall have the highest take up rate out of, this, out of these groups, um, it varies by race and ethnicity. And we will talk about that. Well, we'll, we will see that later in the slideshow. Okay, so here I'm showing you the top 10 largest districts by total enrollment. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because uh, participation rate has really mainly two factors, right? So first, the, the first factor is families deciding whether or not to enroll their children into TK programs um, instead of other other preschool programs, or perhaps not enrolling TK, not enrolling their children as a TK at all. But the second factor is whether the school or district provides TK to begin with. So here I'm showing you, and I want to specifically focus on Los Angeles Unified. Um, and on the horizontal axis, we're showing take up rate at the district level. So again, that optimal uh, take up rate will be 25%. So that's why we have that a uh, vertical line at 25. And for Los Angeles Unified, um, really overachieving and have about a 37% take up rate at the district level, which is much higher than the quote unquote optimal take up rate. This is mainly because they, are, they implemented an optional program called expanded TK. So they expanded eligibility past the September, December birthday. So they included students with January birthdays, February birthdays. Um, so they're able to provide multiple slots throughout their district, throughout their schools. And on top of that, um, this is one of the reasons why dual language learners have such a high take up rate because a lot of them are in Los Angeles Unified and Los Angeles Unified is providing so many slots and spots for TK, which has a big impact on their take up rate. Uh, on the flip side, uh, I'm going to be talking about a district type that isn't providing as much. So here I'm comparing quote unquote LCFF districts to quote unquote basic aid districts. Um, basic aid districts are districts that don't receive state funding because they receive uh, sufficient funding from their local property taxes or due to their local property taxes um, compared to LCFF districts, which are districts that receive state funding, state grants. So we see that in 2019, and uh, on the vertical axis, we have the shared districts providing TK. So in 2019, um, we see that about 85% of LCFF districts provided TK, and these are only for districts that are serving kindergartners, by the way. Um, compared to about 60% of basic aid districts uh, providing TK. And then on top of that, so basic aid districts overall make up about 13% of all districts in 2019, but they made up about 28% of all the districts that did not provide TK. Okay, so now in this graph, I'm showing you a dual language learners take up rate again but this time I'm doing it by district type. So first we have all or all districts um, and then uh, high EL districts, which is districts with a high share of uh, English learners and then high black and Latino um, districts with a high share of black and Latino students. And then high poverty are districts with a high share of uh, students are qualified for free and reduced price meals. And the rural districts, which are just defined by the National Center for Education Statistics. So we can see that in the first four district types are relatively close, right, in terms of 19 to 20% of a dual language learner take up rate. But then by far the lowest is rural districts at about a 14% take up rate. So again, this could be 
uh, you know, the combination of the factors of the district and schools maybe not providing enough slots and families in rural districts just deciding not to uh, enroll their students into TK programs. So on that same token, um, we find that most unserved students reside in districts offering TK, but in school zones that do not. So about 61% of uh, quote unquote unserved students are in districts that do provide TK, but school zones that do not. And what do we mean by unserved students? So again, we're taking that optimal take up rate. So about uh, one fourth of a kindergarten class is eligible for TK. So if a school or district is not serving one fourth of a kindergarten class in terms of TK enrollment, then whatever is left out are what we feel like are unserved students. Now we don't know um, if they're exactly unserved in terms of the family could be deciding on another preschool program. So then they're served by other preschool programs. Um, this is just the data that we are working with. And then, so the second category is 31%. So 31% of unserved students are in schools that do provide TK, but the children are not enrolled. So what we mean by that is that the school is providing TK, but it's not enrolling the amount that we think are eligible, the amount of students that we feel like are eligible given the enrollment data. And then about 8% of unserved students reside in districts that do not provide TK. Okay, so then here I'm showing you um, the percentage of districts that have 80% or more of their schools provide TK. So for example, um, high poverty districts, you see 77% there. So 77% of high poverty districts um, provide TK at 80% or more of their schools. So the vast majority of high poverty districts provide TK at the vast majority of their schools. On the flip side, um, basic aid districts, only about 27%, so about 30% of basic aid districts provide um, TK at 80% or more of their schools and same for rural districts. So, or not the same, but um, it's a relatively low number and uh, it's also a low number for rural districts as well. So this seems like a provision issue for these districts or rural and basic aid districts. Um, now let's see if it's a family decision thing as well. So here I'm showing you the take up rate along uh, 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 different demographics. Um, and this is for specifically if the school is providing. So if the school is providing, it's not a provision issue anymore. We're taking that out, taking that factor out. Is the family deciding on enrolling their children into uh, TK? So we see that um, for the first, you know, six categories, right? Um, they're on par. They're similar to the average. Um, and then again, dual language learners are again the highest, the, have the highest ticket rate, which is positive news. However, uh, the three lowest, which are Black students, Native American students, Pacific Islander students, have relatively low ticket rates, even when the school provides TK. So conclusions, uh, dual language learners, and Latino children participate in TK in relatively high proportions. We saw that this is due to high provision of TK in their districts and schools, um, you know, for example, Los Angeles Unified. And then students from low income families participate at about the same rate as the average student. And we saw in the previous graph where students eligible for free and reduced price meals um, were on average. And we also saw that in the first graph as well. Um, however, Native American and Pacific Islander children appear underrepresented. And this is due because this is due to them being more likely to attend districts and schools where TK is not offered. And participation appears low even when their schools do offer TK. And again, this could be them uh, choosing other programs, right? Choosing other preschool programs. You know, maybe there are many uh, part day programs in rural districts and basic aid districts and the families want full day care. Um, 
we can't speak to that. We're just using our enrollment data. Um, and then in terms of recommendations, um, we think that it's important to provide targeted outreach to groups with low participation, especially Pacific Islander and Native American families. And we also think that it's really important to report enrollment numbers for TK students with special needs. Um, a lot of early childhood education literature speaks to the positive impacts of TK for students with special needs. So we think that um, it's very important to see if, there, if TK is being provided equitably to, spe to students with special needs. And then we also think that it's important to create more incentives for districts to provide TK and maybe consider accountability measures such as including TK provision and the California school dashboard. Um, we also think that it's really important to encourage rural districts to reach out to TK eligible families, um, to the people that we've spoken to with great TK programs at their schools. They really point to how important uh, outreach is to parents and educating them on the possible benefits of TK um, and the even the presence of a TK program. At, the, at their school. And then also, one of the most important things is we think that it is to ensure that all schools offering kindergarten also provide TK. Like what I showed in the little uh, donut graph, um, the highest percentage of quote unquote unserved students are in districts that do provide TK, but schools that do not provide TK. So it's important for schools to provide TK when they're serving kindergartners. And with that, um, I just want to remind everyone to submit your questions to PPIC event questions at gmail.com and please provide your name and organization along with your question. I'm going to stop sharing now. And I would now like to welcome Laura Hill to moderate today's panel discussion. Thank you so much, Manny, for that presentation and really setting us well to have a lively conversation with our panelists. I would now like to welcome our panelists um, and their bios can be found on the PPIC event page. So for today, I'm just going to do brief introductions, but please read there for more details. I'd like to first welcome Stephanie Semensky. She is the Director of Early Learning at San Diego Unified School District. Welcome, Stephanie. I think you're still muted. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. And next, uh, Patricia Lozano, the Executive Director of Early Edge California. Hi, thank you for having me today. Thanks for being here, Patricia. And finally, Stephen Profiter, the Director of Early Education at the California Department of Education. Um, thank you for having me. I'm glad you're here, Steve, thanks. So now I'm just gonna get right into the questions and just remind folks uh, in the audience, please feel free to send your questions our way, but we're gonna hold them till the end. We'll make sure we have time. Um, and so I think we'll just start off by talking about maybe some of the early expansion efforts that are underway. As we saw in the presentation, uh, some districts, even before the announcement that, that TK would become universal by 25, 26, some districts were ahead of the game. Um, and Stephanie, I know you're at a district that's doing a lot of work now to expand in advance of the 2025-26 school year. So I'll ask you to start if you wouldn't mind. Great. So this is, we're entering our third year of expansion. Um, the first year we started with 54 classrooms. Um, this year we expanded to 70 and next year we'll expand to over 132 classrooms. And we have had a um, constant enrollment um, that can meet the needs of that classroom. And to share, um, we're eight days into our pre-registration for 22-23, uh, and we have over 3,000 students right now, and we're eight days in. So um, this it's very exciting um, to expand this as um, it rolls out across the state. So it sounds like there's plenty of demand in your district. Absolutely. Um, we, we do work very, very hard at marketing and communicating and messaging our, our program. Um, and that's one of the keys to the success of the enrollment. And how's it going in finding the staffing? For our staffing, we, um, so some of the things that we've implemented that help support the, this rollout and this expansion is we 
rebranded the program. So our program um, has kind of forged from different names. It started out as um, Pre-K for All, then it went to TK4, and now it's UTK. And we have our own special logo. We make it a very special um, program and a new grade level that people want to be a part of and including teachers. So we took a survey of our district um, and we asked the educators, you know, who'd be interested in UTK or, you know, what would, what are you, would you like to participate in some professional development? And we offered a professional development, we call it a snapshot series. And we did 30 minute increments of overviews of what UTK is or what TK is. And um, we had, high volumes of participants. And right now we have about 75% um, or about 80 plus teachers that want to teach UTK, um, you know, going into our expansion. So that part in itself has been very successful. Um, again, I contributed to have the help of messaging and um, making it very exciting because this classroom, I, every time you, um, someone walks into that room, you, you just leave and you're just so full of joy. It's, it's the most amazing place and everyone can feel it and people want to be a part of it. That's great, thanks for that update. Patricia and Steve, do you, either of you have any news from the field about how early expansion efforts are going? Um, I would just say that, you know, we have, there is a variation, right, across the state. California is very diverse. We have, you know, I'm sure, school districts like San Diego, who's like that they're doing great. And it's of, of course, thanks to Stephanie, which, you know, she's an amazing leader and a believer. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, there are others, uh, smaller uh, or rural communities uh, that are, or, you know, struggling. And I think what, as they, at least for, for us as early edge, we want to be sure that all, all voices are heard and that we really connect and try to, you know, understand their needs and connect them to, you know, the technical assistance they need. Um, and, you know, uh, really, it is it is a, a huge program and it is going to be great uh, to have this available for all families in California. But we understand that, um, you know, we have to all work together and uh, create those learning communities and learn from schools like San Diego school districts and others who have, you know, been working on this for a while and maybe can share some strategies. So I think that that's, you know, it is, it varies, but, um, you know, the hope is that we can all work together and with the support of CDE and others, um, we'll, we'll make it, we'll make it happen. Yeah, I think um, we, so in, in the, the different ways that we've, we've engaged at CDE, um, whether it's it's around, um, you know, the create, you know, creating a planning templates, uh, providing guidance and things like that. We do hear uh, different things uh, across the, the state, like uh, Patricia said, um, you know, we, we've got like the examples, like, you know, Stephanie's district who, you know, filled up the, the TK and, and state preschool kind of blended model. Um, you know, it's, it's been great. Um, and, you know, other, other parts of the state that maybe have, uh, you know, where there's some regional challenges or, around whether it's enrollment, whether it's workforce, um, I think just as we kind of we, we look at the the opportunity, this is our this is our planning year. We've got uh, a few years ahead of us as, as TK expands. It's going to look different in different different parts of the state. Um, we just we kind of sit with the, the great opportunity that we have to to provide uh, you know high quality early education to to all four year olds by 25, 26, and then serve far more three year old children than we've served in in, in the state before, giving one one year or two years. Of, um, of a preschool experience uh, before kindergarten. Um, so as we think about, you know, TK, we're also thinking about um, UPK and the other kind of components. So Head Start, state preschool and, and private preschools. Um, the, uh, we are, um, one thing I'd, I'd be remiss if I uh, didn't mention how appreciative of, we are of the many state and local partnerships that we kind of teamed with us at CDE to support UPK planning and, and implementation. It definitely takes a village to wrap around the individual needs of children and families, and it's, it's absolutely true with UPK implementation. Yeah, there are many complicated and um, components to, to getting to UPK with uh, the existing systems that we have. So it's an exciting time to be working in this space. 
Um, you both, uh, Patricia and Steve, alluded to some of the challenges that small and rural districts are, are facing. You know, we certainly saw in our data that those are some of the districts that are, are not providing as much TK as, you know, are technically eligible based on the number of four-year-olds they might have with the right birth dates. Is there more that you might be able to tell us about what the, some of those challenges are, um, you know, now and going forward? I could maybe start. So um, we have been meeting with with uh, some smaller school districts and in, in, in rural uh, parts of the state to kind of understand, uh, work through some of the issues, right, and see where where there may be solutions. Um, we know one of the things that uh, districts or, or rural kind of areas face is population. Right, and so the population manifests itself in either, you know, enrollment issues or workforce issues. And so we think that we we know that we've heard in some parts of the states some of the options that you know kind of uh, can be leveraged, right, or in are being uh, leveraged is kind of offering that blended TK and CSPP classroom, and in, in some cases multiple funding sources uh, may be needed to 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 be leveraged to blend, say, like state preschool, Head Start, and and other fund sources along with with TK. Uh, we've also heard the, you know, the offering of blended uh, TK or, or kindergarten classroom, um, of course, following, you know, uh, in, in any of those situations, following kind of the more rigorous requirements, uh, making sure they're developmentally informed um, uh, environments. Stephanie, I think you might have mentioned earlier that there were um, some, you, you spoke into some rural districts with some technical assistance or advice, I, if you have any. Absolutely, I, um, I have, and some ideas may work for some and, and others, but some of the things that we talked about um, that we kind of built a partnership was that we built, you know, with, with the online settings and so much availability to collaborate online, you um, developing a partnership even between school districts um, to share professional development, to share teacher collaboration, um, even a buddy system, a peer uh, collaboration network. You know, I call it the old pen pal model, um, where you just have someone that you can talk to and get expertise and leverage, um, like Steve talked about, you know, leverage that expertise and share together, share best practices. Um, another um, thing we talked about was partnering with universities or um, because they have special recruitment events, even for their preparation programs. And with the multitude of grants that CDE offers, I think this is a perfect time um, to reach out to universities and see if they um, have teachers that are interested in positions um, that could possibly come to their district. Uh, another thing that we have done is that we've partnered with rural districts um, in hiring events if they're online. Um, and one thing we talked about pre-COVID pre was partnering with Head Start, and they were um, working on a system or a, a way that they could provide transportation to families. And so we're leveraging that resource and working together um, to help get them into our CSPP programs, to help get them into UTK, um, could adapt or be used at a, at a rural setting as well. Thanks, Stephanie. Oh, Patricia. Yeah, I, I would just add that, I mean, as, as, as I was listening to the data from your report, um, it seems like an opportunity, for example, to see how we can increase uh, enrollment for DLLs in rural districts, right? So just understanding uh, what, the why and then seeing what can we do to um, you know, improve the enrollment of those who you know, benefit the most, right? Um, and, and other, and other you know, groups um, that we saw that you know, may not be participating and understanding the why, right? The why and really going deeper on, on specific strategies that might work. So I think this is, I see it as an opportunity to, to understand why and then think about outreach strategies for that, for those families who, you know, um, may benefit but may, may not know about the program or support those schools to, to see what may work for them to offer the program. Do you have any thoughts about how to get to the why? I mean, in the, our examination of the CDE, the publicly available CDE data, we're often asked that question and we're at a loss to, to explain. We know we need to talk to people, but I think you all, you three are doing much uh, more of that kind of talking than we are. Yeah, I mean, what, you know, and I'm talking from the early edge perspective, but as Steve mentioned, there are, I mean, uh, opportunities already of groups that come together, for example, right? Or uh, organizations that are already convening LEAs, right? Or, um, you know, 
education groups that, you know, you just join those efforts. And, and that's what we've done. Like, for example, we partnered with Accent and joined one of their meetings and listen, just listen and, and learn. Um, so I think identify, and I, I think CD also is saying, well, what, what's happening across the state where people are getting together so they can join and really understand and ask and, and, and also, you know, how do we work together to find solutions, right? Um, given that we know that there is a teacher shortage, right? That enrollment is going down and there are problems already there, but of course, you know, this could be an opportunity. And we, we also saw that, um, you know, kindergarten enrollment was one of the few grades that was increasing. So maybe, you know, there is the, this hope that things are gonna get better and that this could be an opportunity uh, of, you know, just listening and learning and working together to, because they, you know, the schools know what they need, right? So, you know, just listening and, and um, teaming up to connect them with others, I think could be a good strategy. One question that we get asked a lot that I was hoping to ask you all and see if you have some insights is uh, about the appeal of full versus part day TK um, and how much of a factor you think that is in families wanting to participate, uh, what your understanding is of, of if their plans to expand to more full day kinds of TK options. I can, I can speak to that. Um, our full day parent families, I mean, they're ecstatic over it. They're, there's, they love it. It, it works for the schedule. Um, it works for working families. Um, it works for um, the neighborhood schools. But I, I think from an educator or practitioner's perspective, what the full day offers the students is there's time in the day for cooperative learning. So you have a literacy, a math block, you, you have all your content areas, but there's also time for peer interactions or um, small group, flexible grouping, and where, where teachers can do a closer look at assessments. Um, where students can be working on projects, more project-based, and they're solving problems together. And of course, they can have movement, play, lunch, um, you know, all the fun things that kids love about school. Um, they get to experience it just like their, their peers in K through five or their, or their big brother or sister. Um, I, the full day mat matches all those requirements that is more of the whole child. I'm happy to jump in here too. Um, so I think at, at CDE, we could say what we're all in on, on full day. Um, the, uh, as we look at the, the statute that authorizes funding to support UPK planning, it specifically says, you know, LEAs are planning for how um, children the, will have access to a full day of learning the year before kindergarten that meets the needs of families. Um, we're absolutely recommending that LEAs prioritize full day uh, as they're thinking about, you know, UPK, both in TK and, and state preschool. We heard that even in, in some of our state preschool uh, through the RFA that we released um, about uh, going and LEAs that may have, have thought about part day before moving to full day with, with state preschool. Because that, that's what meets, you know, families' needs. Um, you know, we know there's other, other opportunities out there to support that we think about the expanded learning opportunities funding, which is specifically, um, specifically identified also to go down to tra transitional kindergarten. That hasn't been something that's been um, a, a, as clear a, a priority. Um, and also as we think about like what research says like in other places around full day access. Um, so there's a study out of Chicago that looked at Chicago public schools pre-K policies and access and it found that high priority children increased participation in public pre-K programs when those programs offered were offered for a full day. Um, so they quadrupled you know, the offerings of, of, of full day pre-K, publicly available pre-K, uh, pre um, and uh, tripled the uh, enrollment of their, their high priority uh, population. So um, thinking about, you know, black students, students living in, in, in lowest income neighborhoods uh, were, were more likely to enroll in full day pre-K following those, those policy changes. So the study, the, the research is there, it works, and we, and we know, you know, we, we've known in early education so fam, working families need. Um, I would just add that especially now that we're hopefully coming back <laughs> to uh, a normal, more normal uh, experience for kids, um, it, this is, is huge, 
And we know that, especially for women that want to go back to work, um, we need the full day. And parents, you know, just having their the peace of mind that their kids are going to be in one place, that it's safe, that it's, you know, they're going to have a good um, learning experience is, is going to be huge. So, yeah, we're all supportive and uh, hopefully we, you know, all um, programs are going to be able to offer this full day um, to all kids. Well, you three have very much made the case for the developmental reasons and the, and the family support reasons that's so important to have full day available to TK families. Are there other kinds of things that you think are going to be really important for families as they're considering their expanded option? You know, in the future, they might be able to choose TK, whereas in the past, it wasn't an option based on their child's birthday. Um, other kinds of things that you think will draw them to the program that will be important for them? Stephanie, how about you? Yeah, one thing, um, one thing that we focused on during our expansion is also that inclusive settings that the report talked about. Um, so at each of, you know, throughout our, throughout our district and in, in areas, um, certain areas of the district, we have built a continuum of services. And so we may have a special settings for students with disabilities that, that um, allows inclusive settings for them to be in our CSPP um, part day program, our blended setting, and also the UTK and then K-5. And that has, that has allowed, um, and the full day model meets that need too, because um, the students are joining during different class time, during different projects, um, working in that whole continuum of services. And, and the benefit of that is, um, or a draw for a family to enroll at that point is there's no transitions. Um, research is definitely um, talks about you know early learning settings and the, the try to minimize the transitions because you don't want your child to go to one school and then another school and another school and build those and forge those relationships. So when you enroll um, within our district at you know two years old, three years old, you're gonna you're gonna be moving up the system until fifth grade, um, with people you know in a, an environment you know. And so the conditions um, were created like that, you know, very purposefully. Steve, Patricia, anything to add? It's okay if no. <laughs> I would just say that for parents having a free available program in their neighborhood, right? We want, that's the message, you know. Uh, we want parents to, uh, you know, get the information, find out when it's going to be available, um, right? And then find whatever it works for them, right? We have parent choice, so they can keep their, their kids in the program there if they, that's what they want, but there's, there's going to be this option too. So hopefully um, each parent will have, uh, you know, the, the, the choice to, to select whatever works for them, but it is about information, right? It's about saying, this is, this is for you. And hopefully, you know, the earlier you start, the, the better, and this matters, right? So uh, I think that um, it's just, it's gonna be great for families. Uh, I'm just going to remind the audience that in a few minutes, like seven, we will have time for audience Q&A. So if you do have some questions, uh, please do send them to this email address. It's ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. There's the slide right there with the address. So ppiceventquestions, all one word, no dots, at gmail.com. And we, luckily, we still have some time for questions among us before audience Q&A. Um, oh, Stephen, go ahead. If I can just add on, I think I, I agree with uh, what Patricia said. And there's something in what Stephanie shared earlier about the um, um, so there uh, about the communication, right? And so there's communication is, is really important. Communication to, to parents and family engagement and parent engagement, uh, not just parent you know involvement, but in, in engagement, right? Um, so. I, I think we'd want to emphasize that to any parent who's thinking about whether to enroll their their the child in a UPK program. And as Patricia said, it's there's parent choice, state preschool, Head Start. The the existence of TK does not kind of mandate enrollment in in TK, uh, but it just how beneficial um, and the long term effects of having that that strong foundation that that early education provides through uh, through through UPK. Great, sorry, I interrupted the flow there. <laughs> um, so, you know, the data that we showed was up through the 
2020 school year and then expansion is this is a planning year and expansion starts next year but the most recent tk data just came out for 2020 21 that was a school year where most schools were mostly remote um and i cannot even imagine what a tk remote would have looked like so not surprisingly, in some ways, um, the TK numbers were really down more so than they were for kindergarten, even during that year. And this is not unique to TK. This is the same across all kinds of early childhood experiences in California and nationally. Um, and the enrollment declines were most steep, it looks like, among low-income families and families with dual language learners, the students that we'd really hope to provide these opportunities for. How, um, how are you all thinking about that and kind of on the beginning of the expansion journey, when we took a step back, do you feel like this is likely to return no problem um, for the incoming cohorts, or is this sorry, making an extra uh, hurdle for for expansion efforts? Stephanie, I know you're you're an expansion land like crazy, but maybe if you yeah. Just speak to this a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, this is and there is a key factor that um, that, that Steve and Patricia just talked about was. Communicating, communicating is so important, but also having your building leadership capacity within your district or your organization. Um, so one thing that we did was our message was shared across the board. So our area superintendents, any chance they could get, they spoke about it. Um, the, our superintendent spoke about it. Um, our board of education, we, we did media blasts and print blasts, but it, during those times, we also we talked about what the child's day would look like, what the schedule looks like, what they're learning, what they could expect at home. Um, and one of the unique things that we did was um, because of the transition of online environment to in-person was we had a panel such as this, but it was with parents, parents for parents. And um, the parents, you know, what they've experienced and the, the growth that they've seen in their child to hear it from that parent's lens and perspective. Um, it was so powerful and, and it really, really helped set the stage for why the why now, why is it so important now? Um, and so that's, that's some of the things that I think have contributed to holding steady on expansion and keeping that enrollment up to par. Patricia, Steve, any, anything to add there? Um, yeah, I just think, I mean, we, we are all kind of starting over. And I do think that one thing that Stephanie mentioned that is super important is engagement at every level, right? That it's, um, you know, hearing from parents, hearing from teachers, hearing from, and engaging leadership, right? Um, so um, you, you really, they really understand why this, this is important. Um, and then uh, how, you know, parents need, need to feel safe and they need to understand that um, how to, because there is, it is amazing how much confusion uh, there is out there um, in ter because of everything that has happened. We went through a very difficult time, right, for two years. And now it's like, it, you know, it is all about how we communicate this and how we explain um, and make parents feel comfortable again. And, you know, seeing that, um, you know, there was uh, kindergarten, the kindergarten data on enrollment, it is, it is concerning, right? But that means like, okay, what else can we do? So parents can hear from parents. And I think that's such a great idea because I'm a parent. And if someone, if a parent says it is okay and my child is gonna learn and you can feel, because that's all what we want for our kids, right? To be safe and to, to be at the best place that works for us. So I think it's bringing back that confidence to all these families that went through like a huge trauma, right? And we know that uh, especially, if, uh, you know, families of color and people who were greatly impacted by COVID, it was harder, right? So they're like, am I safe? You know, can I send my kid to school when I, I live with grandma at home, right? It's like all these things that COVID is out there still. So so I think it is up to us and others to collaborate and, and create that environment where everybody feels um, safe about going back to, to these uh, great opportunities and great programs, so... I know we're, we're short on time, but I'll just add that I 100% agree. Family engagement is so critical and the parent-to-parent -parent, um, connection, um, absolutely. I, I'm the, the, the parent of, of two, two of my, both of my daughters were in, in TK. One was 
age eligible, the other was early admittance, and we made the decision for our, our second daughter to be early admittance TK because of the experience that our older daughter had. So that and, and the and the engagement with the the, the, the teacher and, and and parents is critical. Well, it sounds like an uh, excellent, encouraging note to end our, our, this portion of our conversation on. Thank you to the three of you for those great um, conversations. And now I think we're going to begin our audience Q&A. Um, and if those questions will start becoming visible to me in just a moment, and I'll be able to send them your way. Um, so here we go. Thank you for these questions. Uh, first from Carolyn um, in Huntington Beach School District, City School District. How can we support early childhood professionals with access to workforce group opportunities that are not working with state funded programs? For example, um, the California State Preschool Program. Steve, is that a good one for you? Yeah, I can I can start with maybe a, a, there's a couple of things. So there's um, one of the things I didn't mention is in this year's budget there's a hundred million. We know there's you know a greater need, but there's a hundred million um, to uh, not to expand the, the the credentials, the qualifications of early education teachers, not just TK. So TK and state preschool were specifically uh, called out um, as an opportunity, and uh, LEAs. Um, you know, could apply for funding um, and then apply on behalf of a consortium, uh, which included, you know, which can include community-based programs. We think that's a that's a good model. We always want would would you know like to see more funding and for 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 workforce. Um, but there's that. There's Quality Counts California as well, which is I, I point to. It's a it's a you know state um, statewide system that that supports uh, the workforce and in, in early education. Um, one of the, I can t um, add on to that. One of the things that we worked um, hard on was creating a pipeline and partnering with um, the University of Laverne, WGU, and San Diego State University. And we um, there's there's different hybrid models of education that um, the workforce can participate in, and, it, and it's not exclusive to one grade level over the other. But they're online. Um, we have a special San Diego cohort. We have scholarships offered to our employees in different varied options, such as that to help our workforce grow um, professionally and personally. Okay, I'm gonna switch to another audience question. Um, this is from Maria Patricia, Patricia um, in the Marin Promise Partnership. And the question is, how do you work with community partners such as your local r, &R family child care provider and private preschools to make this successful in your community? Uh, what have you learned from your experience? I think Stephanie, that might be directed towards you most easily because you're the one who's actually doing this in a particular place. Everyone else has a broader view. Um, thank you. So one thing that I, I started from the very beginning was, um, and, I, and I also think, uh, let me st take a step back. I think um, I've been a school administrator or a principal or a vice principal in my um, 20 plus years of being in, as a practitioner. And I worked at the early learning, the elementary, the middle school and high school levels. And I know firsthand when they walk across that stage and when they graduate from high school and, and when they come in and in preschool, it's, you know, it, I, I can speak from what I've witnessed, what I've seen and what I've witnessed. And um, that, that feels into when I work with um, organizations and partners. So when I talk to um, the San Diego Foundation or Head Start or First Five or um, private providers, there's there's a knowledge base that um, that I can share that where that why it's so important that we leverage our expertise and where we're headed and how we can partner along the, the way. That it's not um, I don't always view early learning as a silo. I view it as a continuum and as and as a springboard. Um, for, for more learning and lifelong learning success. And so I think having that vision and, and strategic um, thinking in developing relationships and collaboration, we schedule monthly collaboration meetings, um, you know, even partner, even partnering with the CDE and Early Edge is, has changed our, has changed our life. So um, using those resources and, and um, getting to know people and we're all, we're all in it for the same reason. And once you peel that back, you will think of amazing things that you could do to support your district. 
Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I, I think in some ways, there's some parts of this question that we've touched on already, but others not. Um, so I'll just pose it and see how we do. Uh, this is a question from Rosemary at Cuesta College. Um, how are schools meeting the need for educators with early childhood experience in order to make the student to teacher ratios that are required? Um, if early childhood educators are a part of meeting this need, how is pay equity ensured? Steve, is that one a good one for you? Yeah, I could start. I mean, the 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 question of pay often, um, you know, often comes up, um, and and we know that it's 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 come up for for years. Uh, if you've been in early education, it pay and wages are are a pretty big, um, consistent uh, theme. Um, one of the things that we look to for um, our, you know, kind of the breadth of our, our UPK programs is particularly those that are state funded. Um, we the, the state has taken some, some pretty big steps um, towards uh, rate reform, and that's materialized in increased reimbursement rates in a number of our counties, so like our state preschools or general child care programs for infants and toddlers and, and other subsidy programs. Um, so, and, and the, the, the idea is that, you know, with increased rates, you can address, uh, you're, you're better equipped to uh, address um, wages. And, and I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't mention that May Revise is supposed to um, uh, drop tomorrow. And so we don't know what exactly will be in there, but um, there's been a lot of, of advocacy around uh, rates and, and, and wages for um, around this topic. So we'll definitely stay tuned for that. Go ahead, Stephanie. Oh, I can just add on a little bit. Um, prior to UTK implementation, when we had when it was called TK4, um, we commingled funds using the CSPP and um, LCFF funds, and we actually had a co-teaching model um, where we have an ECE teacher in the same classroom with the multiple subject TK teacher, leveraging that expertise and resources and funding streams, um, like. Um, Steve talked about earlier. And um, one thing that that allows us to do is with our partnerships with the universities is it also eliminates barriers um, for student teaching or field work experience because that, that teacher is in the classroom. So they're able to get on the pipeline, have a full-time employment um, and not have to pause or take a leave of absence from work um, to complete the requirements. And so um, that's one thing that we recognize was to eliminate those challenges and barriers. And another thing that we um, implemented the last two years was an additional stipend for our early childhood teachers teaching in that UTK classroom um, with the more um, workload and, and more um, rigorous academic program. Okay, I think I'll go to another audience question. Oh, Patricia, did you wanna add on? No, I was just going to say I, I had the chance to learn about the co-teaching model from San Diego. And I want to say and I want to incentivize people to really check it out because it's a great, you know, team effort between, you know, an experienced ECE teacher and um, and a TK teacher. So you get the best for from both uh, worlds. So um, I, I would invite uh, people who are interested to, to check it out and, and talk to Stephanie and learn about it. Uh, here is an audience question from Melina Simmons at Cuesta College. Um, she asks, in your discussion of equity in TK, how will children's access to hands-on, play-based, child-directed experiences be preserved and enhanced and honored? How will you make sure that administrators and teachers carry out developmentally appropriate practice in TK UPK? Well, um, we I mean, it's, it's built into our foundational, it's built into our schedule. And one thing that to ensure it is we built it into our professional development and um, all the things that we do. So the cooperative learning, um, when students enter the classroom, you can you have purposeful play, intentional play. Um, it's, it's a belief across the system. And again, it's part of that messaging. When we talk about, um, when we talk about UTK or we talk about how exciting it is. That's part of the conversation. Um, it's not, it's not left out. It's, it's very visible. It's um, when you come witness a classroom, you'll see it. You, you know, we talk about the gradual release of independence too. Students are directing themselves and problem solving. And so it's a huge part of our program. 
Um, everyone knows it, and we make sure to um, add it into our leadership PD and our educator PD series. Patricia, Stephen, anything to add there? Go, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to just take a moment to highlight the, uh, the preschool learning foundations um, and how uh, we know that, that, that learning happens through play and any TK curriculum uh, needs to be, you know, needs to be based on, on the preschool learning foundations. And I also wanted to flag that we've got uh, the, the administration and the legislature also invested $10 million in this year's budget to update the preschool learning foundations to address uh, um, a, a year of learning um, before kindergarten in a school based setting. Um, I love uh, a lot of what, what, what Stephanie was saying, the co-teaching model, right? Uh, but then also kind of providing those, the, the, the additional resources, right, um, around, um, you know, through the updates to the Preschool Learning Foundations and curriculum and, and other resources that will, will come through that work. I was just going to say that. So we we're like synced <laughs> How about the, so people know that that's happening. The Preschool Foundations have, have you know, are being revised and with that purpose to be sure that um, you know uh, schools have the resources to to really uh, develop and continue to implement a play based appropriate curriculum for for four year olds. Great. Well, I think we're coming to the end, so I'm just going to ask one last question that I'd love each of you to answer, if you wouldn't mind. Um, just wondering if there's anything in particular you're looking for, hoping for in the May revision that will be coming our way tomorrow. Um, and Patricia, do you mind going first? Um, you know, as Steve said, you know, uh, hopefully, um, you know, we will get uh, some additional money for uh, high reimbursement rates for, you know, the EC world. We need, we know we, we appreciate all the work that our EC teachers do. And then the more we can uh, provide higher compensation, uh, you know, it is, it is fair and hopefully we, we can get there. Um, we're excited that, you know, TK is going to be funded. So um, that, of, of course, um, hopefully that's going to be in it. And, you know, uh, as many more resources for the workforce. Uh, I know this is, it's been hard. It's been hard during COVID. And the more we can support those who are doing the work, um, you know, the best for our families and, and children. Stephanie, how about you? Um, and I, I'll say funding as well, but in, in another context too, to add on to that is, um, because funding gives you freedom to provide collaboration. And so we could forge partnerships with districts across the state. We can, um, we can have that time for vertical alignment that's so important within the school where the um, preschool teacher meets with the TK teacher and the kindergarten teacher, and, and we have that collaboration time um, to talk about the data and talk about the growth of the students. I think that that would be a wonderful use of funding. And Stephen, I'm going to give you the final word here. Thank you. I think I'll go a slightly different direction. So thinking about the, the January budget, because we don't know what's, what's exactly going to be in the May revise, but we know in the, the governor's original proposal in January was to um, fund uh, um, uh, in uh, fund slots in our state preschool programs up to 10% uh, reserved for, for children with disabilities. We know that inclusion works, right? Inclusion, inclusion matters. And um, so we are, uh, we're looking forward to kind of any updates um, on that, um, as well as uh, supports for, for our state preschools as, as well. Terrific. Thank you each so much, Stephanie, Steve, Patricia. This has been a really great conversation. Um, we've reached the end of our program. I really want to thank you all for joining us today, those of you in the audience, our panelists members, and Manny also for your presentation. Uh, also, thank you to our supporters, but most especially to the Sobrato Family Foundation for their support of this research and for this event. Um, and I wanted to note if you've pre-registered, there will be a survey coming your way. Please tell us how we've done today. Um, and before signing off, I'd like to let you know about an upcoming event on May 24th. Julian LaFortune will be briefing us on his new report, Understanding the Effects of School Funding. And this is gonna be PPIC's first in-person event since early 2020. And yes, there will be beer bread. Um, it will also be broadcast online. So please see our events page to register. And thank you again for joining us. Please be safe and have a good afternoon. <laughs>